Hello, hello. How is everybody doing? Let me make myself big there. Uh, welcome to class. This is for now the last smart live English for academic purpose class taught by yours truly, Joshua Porter. Um, I'm here in our beautiful Spokane studio and it's a bit of a somber day, of course. I'm sad to go. I, um, I've enjoyed having everybody here so much in class. Uh, all of you students that have been with us for the longest time. Um, Rosa, I think you are maybe our longest student. Uh, Steve, Leo, uh, Sarbajit, you came on a little bit later, but you are a very diligent student. You're always in class, always doing your homework. You guys are great. Um, I want to make sure I take the time to mention everybody here uh, that I can. So don't let me leave you out. Julian, of course. Um, Thank you for being here. You say no sound, but the sound is on. I think everybody else can hear me. So uh, maybe check your settings. Rosa can hear and see me. So uh, Julian, I think it's on your end. So maybe just refresh the page or open it up again. Uh, yeah, so French Leo, uh, a lot of people. So we may have some, JB is here. Uh, we may have some students that are here for the first time. And... Uh, Vency, of course. Um, let's see. I'm sure people are going to be coming in. I, I'm probably going to miss somebody, so I'll just say a big thank you to you watching right now. Uh, you, as a student, are what makes a teacher a teacher. Without you, I have no one to teach, so my job is meaningless. So students are absolutely the most important part of any teacher's life, and, and you guys are that for me. So... Um, you know, when it comes to my job, my classroom, my uh, what I like to do, what I love to do, it's teach. And you guys are here for that, and I, I thank you. So thank you so much. A lot of times, students thank me. They say, thank you for teaching me this. Thank you for this lesson. And while I'm grateful and appreciative that, uh, that you guys thank me, you need to know that I thank you. Thank you for being here and for letting me teach you. It's great. Um, okay. So, uh, we're going to go into a reading class, um, and, oh, uh, Ahmed from Somalia, it's your first time here. Well, it's my last class, so I'm sorry that we just met right now, but you can go back and look at other classes, and, and I'm not, uh, dearie, I hate saying goodbye to you. It's okay, though. We'll get through it. Um, Steve thinks the teacher and the students are equally important. Sure, I'd agree. We need each other. Um... Rosa, and thank you from the bottom of my heart, too. Um, I'm, I'm happy I helped you improve your English. Uh, I hope I helped everybody improve their English, and I hope you go on to do great things. Like, use that English. Use it to make friends, use it to travel, use it to make the world a better place. That will make me happy. Um, thank you, I appreciate it. You like my hat. Uh, me too, it's my favorite hat. Uh, hello from Argentina. Anna is from Argentina. Hi, Argentina. All of Argentina. How's it going? Um, all right. Uh, student for the second time, for Kat. Uh Hello. Thank you for coming back. All right. Julian's back. Can you hear us now, Julian? Um, let me know. All right. You're very, very welcome. You are so, so welcome. I'm, I'm really happy to have had this experience with you guys. It's great. All right, uh, let's bring up the lesson. I'm going to bring up the lesson behind me. Uh, bam. Right there. And I'm going to take attendance really quick. Um, everybody looks like they are signed in and are good to go. So, taking attendance. So, everybody wanted reading today. And I thought, okay, cool. Um, I've just finished um, creating with uh, another colleague of mine. Um, the fantastic and wonderful Nicole. You guys may remember her from previous smart classes. She did them for a very short time before Abby. Uh, Tile, hi. Hi, Karen from Sao Paulo. Good to have you. Uh, I've spoken with a lot of people from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and it uh, seems like a beautiful city. Um, I forget what I was saying now. Uh, oh, Nicole and I. So Nicole and I... Uh, Julian's threatening Beatles. Uh, Nicole and I created together um, this idea of smart English for STEM. Uh, English for STEM, really. It's, it's English for the purposes of studying STEM fields and students who want to go into 
um, graduate school or want to perfect their English before they go into undergraduate school. Barat, it's okay, you're late, good to have you. Uh, students today, we have from, JB, according to JB, students are from Brazil, Argentina, Algeria, Bulgaria, Syria, Turkey, India, Georgia, uh, Tajikistan, I think is how I say that, and Pakistan. So awesome group of, of countries represented. This is very, very cool. Um, so we created this class, English for STEM, and uh, I thought we would do a reading from that. This is brand new. It's never been taught before. Um, so we're going to check it out. It is uh, in the English for Specific Purpose section. I also created uh, English for Health Sciences right here, English for Automotive, um, several of the English for Automotive classes, actually. And uh, this is the newest one. So English for STEM is... Like I said, something I created collaboratively uh, with Nicole, and we try to make it really, really cool. We put virtual reality stuff in there, vocabulary builder. Um, we focused on APA formatting because that's so important for, for so many students. Uh, we also have Columbia and Las Vegas represented. Uh, Julian's living in Las Vegas. That's awesome. So this has a lot of cool stuff. This has uh, the English of mathematics, so how to use English terms in mathematics, how to do math in English, basically. It's not a lesson on how to do math, but it's a lesson on how to do the, how to use or know or learn the English of mathematics. We have Iraq uh, represented in the class also. Uh, and, and there's a lot of cool stuff. There's cloning, there's stem cells, there's CRISPR, there's um, lots of stuff in here. Um, we focused on a lot of science, mathematics, the Bunnock Tarski paradox. There's a great video on that online. Neil deGrasse Tyson's in here. Um, uh, we have statistics and biology, um, pharmacology, uh, computer science, things on um, quantum computing and qubits. We have Disney and Pixar shorts uh, because that, of course, takes a lot of computer science to generate those types of things. Um, like I said, virtual reality, we have things on dinosaurs, Bill Nye, it's really cool. I had a lot of fun building it and, um, and I think it'll be a really cool class. So I chose one just at random because students wanted reading last week. Um, this is making humans a multi-planetary species. Now I know French Leo is a big fan of, um, uh, space and space exploration, so Hopefully you'll like this lesson. Um, I think a lot of you are interested in the sciences and it's important to know that the vocabulary we pick up, the academic vocabulary that may be used in biology um, is also sometimes used in chemistry, statistics, engineering. These fields share language and we call that language academic vocabulary, academic language. Um, it's a little different than formal language. Formal language can, is often structure and grammatically um, syntactically uh, thought of. Academic language is can be creative, it can be um, innovative, it can be different, um, but it is careful. Academic language is carefully chosen to convey meaning in a strong, effective, and finite way, if that makes sense. Uh, a little more coffee there. So this lesson we called Making Humans a Multiplanetary Species. And I'm just going to read a little bit about it. We're going to jump in and it's going to be awesome. French Leo says, I'm a curious guy. I like to understand how matter works. Uh, Vinci says, Neil deGrasse Tyson inherited the great Carl Sagan, didn't he? So Neil deGrasse Tyson is a predecessor of uh, Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan came first. And then Neil deGrasse Tyson had an opportunity to meet Carl Sagan at one, one point. I think he, they only met the one time, but I know that Carl Sagan's work heavily influenced Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, whose work then influences other people. So uh, they were alive around the same time, and Neil deGrasse Tyson, of course, Neil deGrasse, I think he pronounces it deGrasse Tyson, uh, he is still alive doing lots of cool stuff. Um, 
Carl Sagan has has passed away. Uh, his wife, or f- former wife, whatever you want to say, um, still produces a lot of cool stuff. She produced um, the new, what is it, uh, Cosmos that Neil deGrasse Tyson narrated. So, anyway, uh, yeah, they they work together. I mean, they work in the same field. Uh, Qatar is here. Okay. Vinay feels thirsty every time I drink. Oh, cool. Are you thirsty? <laughs> it's it's not Ramadan or anything, so I don't... I feel like I can do that. It's not a big deal. Unless you're watching this later during Ramadan, I'm sorry. Uh, if I'm making you thirsty. Elon is maybe too optimistic about reaching Mars. Maybe. So that's a good discussion. Let's talk about this. Elon Musk um, is the chief executive officer for his company SpaceX in Hawthorne, California. Uh, there's a paper written by Elon Musk, so we're going to look at academic writing from uh, a very successful billionaire um, who is involved in engineering in terms of automotive, aeronautics, um, and infrastructure. He wants to do solar roofs and, and infrastructure of electricity for people all over to have clean, reliable, um, and affordable power. So it's a lot of cool stuff. JB hates Elon Musk. Why do you hate Elon Musk? Um, and Julian's never heard of him. So this is going to be a good class. We have some people who have information, like French Leo knows that he's too optimistic or believes that he's too optimistic. We have Julian, who this is a new person, uh, who we could experience him to. We have um, JB, who is, has a negative opinion of Elon Musk for some reason. Um, and it's okay. I want you guys to voice these opinions. Let's talk about this guy. Uh, Sarbajit has never heard of him. Um, this is somebody you probably want to to research uh, and look into. Who is this guy? What does he do? There's tons of information on the internet. I promise. Just Google his name or search for his name. Um, Candy is here. Hi, Candy. Uh, so Elon Musk did a presentation at the 67th International Aeronautic Congress in Guadalajara, Mexico, in September of 2016. So. Uh, about a year ago from this date. It's almost September 2017 uh, when we're filming this. In February 2017, so just a few months ago, SpaceX announced it will launch a crewed mission beyond the moon for two private customers in late 2018. So what does that mean? That information seems a little disparate, um, unconnected. The connection you'll see is um, that we have gone from writing papers about advancing space travel to uh, commercial space travel where you can hopefully someday in the future probably for a little hefty price book a trip to you know the moon or, or Mars for your average person to to uh, travel to Mars oh no Rosa says unfortunately I gotta go Thank you again for jo- Josh for everything. You were the best. I wish you the best in your life. I will miss you so much. I will miss you too, Rosa. Um, I'm not dying though. I'll still be here. Uh, you can email me. You can Facebook me. You, we're friends on Facebook. Um, for anybody else, you guys can add me. I'll put this in the chat. Um, and I'll, I'll put it in our notes here. It's facebook.com backslash Mr. P- MR period Joshua Porter. So yeah. Check it out and uh, and friend me or whatever. But we will miss you too. Thank you for being in class. Um, okay, so SpaceX um, is trying to forward space travel and revolutionize space travel. Um, I'm just going to type bye to Rosa here. There we go. Uh, <laughs> so... They, they're going to launch a crewed mission uh, beyond the moon for two private customers. So th- I'm using this topic to focus on academic reading. That's what we're talking about today. So let's talk about academic reading too. We've introduced this topic as kind of a teaser. I'm going to preview that for you. We're going to talk about it later. Reading academic work, um, it can be tedious. It can be time consuming. Um, it's, it's not as casual as reading a Facebook blog or, or post or um, watching, you know, 
a short news clip or, or flipping through the, the weekly paper or morning paper. Um, that can be kind of casual because you're, you're engaged in it. Uh, you picked it up because you wanted to pick it up. Academic reading is usually assigned to you. Um, it's a topic that you may have no information about. So um, for Julian, this, this is a person, this is a concept that is maybe less familiar. And that's cool. Um, we have to sort of train our minds to believe that that's cool. Uh, even if our instincts go against that, right? Someone says, hey, read this. You have to read this. Your grade and your success depends on it. I think a natural human reaction is to kind of go, ugh, really? Uh, I have to do this? Like, I don't know about you guys, but when I'm told I must do something, I have to do this thing, it instantly becomes less fun for me, less enjoyable, because it's obligation. It's, it's something you have to do. Um, it's kind of like the difference between choosing to go to a nice restaurant because you want to experience it and um, getting to the point where you're so hungry that you have to eat. Uh, when you have to eat, it's not, you don't really enjoy it. Um, you get hungry to the point where you're like, I must eat. And then it's just sustenance, right? You're just surviving. Um, but if, if you, you know, are, get to a place where you're, you're choosing to go somewhere to eat, um, it's, it's more enjoyable because it's, it's a choice. You, you're, you have options. So I like the options of academic reading and, um, and I include that here. So below is a short list of tips that I've created to make academic content more interesting. A lot of students tell me their biggest complaint is, Josh, I, I don't like to read or I don't like reading for class. How do I get around that? So I've created a list to try to help you out with it. Um, I'm following the notes here. It looks like uh, uh, Fabio is watching Alien Covenant. <laughs> Focus on class, Fabio. This is our last class, man. Come on. Come on. Um, <laughs> Elon Musk created Tesla. That's correct. Um, Vinay, uh, yes, this is the last class. Uh, and I'll say my goodbyes at the end, but stick around. This is the last class uh, for me for now. I've heard that every pound costs ten thousand dollars to take to the moon obviously it's very expensive Vincy, yeah i think space travel is expensive um uh okay so tr space travel french leo says is for rich people but hopefully uh for elon if the mission explodes in this way they cannot move or c more complain or have a refund. <laughs> Your sentence is not quite sensible or, or sensical. I don't, I'm not sure exactly what you're saying. Do you mean an actual explosion or do you mean like become bigger in popularity? Uh, okay. 44 people watching now. That's awesome. Thanks, guys. Good to have you here. Uh, Sarbji, I'll, I'll chat about that towards the end of the uh, end of the lesson, okay? So here are some tips. Here are some reading tips for all you academics out there. All of you are academics. You're all bright, um, brilliant, smart students who are going to do great things. So when possible, choose your own text. This is like the least likely thing that you're going to be able to do in academic reading. Your teachers are probably going to assign your texts. Texts. But sometimes your class situation allows you to choose what you can read. Um, they'll either give you options and you should explore those options carefully and choose what interests you most, or you can seek out your own options. It is imp uh, very, very important to find credible sources though. So study is generally rigorous. Your teacher's uh, rigor or, or something that is rigorous is challenging and, and difficult and takes a lot of commitment and effort. So when possible, seek out your own reading material um, and make sure it's credible sources that are worth reading. You want to use your time wisely. Uh, <laughs> so credible sources, what are those? I link to this 
because I think it's important and I use it a lot. The um, online writing lab through Purdue uh, has a lot of great information on writing, reading and writing. Um, and this is written work being a credible source is uh, how to find credible sources in terms of writing ties in with reading, reading and writing, right? Um, so here's a good list of information on how to determine if something is credible. Uh, figure out who the author is. Are they a credible person? Are they verified by their peers in their field? If they're a biologist, do other bi biologists agree that they do good work? Um, how recent is the source? Is the material from uh, current knowledge? Or is this something that was written 200 years ago where we knew a lot less? Uh, what is the author's purpose? So this ties in with who is the author. Um, what is the author's purpose? Do they have an agenda? Do they want to make you feel one way or another whether or not their writing seems biased? The writing could seem very neutral, but it's important to know if they have a strong bias towards one area or another because then you can be more critical of their, their work. Um, and to be critical in academics is crucial and important. Um, you should be open to criticism and you should be willing to be critical. Uh, how recent is the source? What is the author's purpose? Um, what types of sources does your audience uh, value? So this is only for writing. You're thinking about your own audience. Um, and then be especially careful when evaluating internet sources. Basically, internet sources can be total crap, uh, absolute garbage, or they can have a little bit of truth or uh, a good amount of truth. But you should always be willing to, you should be skeptical. Um, it's healthy to be skeptical. And you should be um, critical when, when deciding what you read, uh, whether or not what you read is true. And don't waste your time on reading junk that's not true unless it's for that purpose, like reading a novel or fiction for enjoyment. Uh, so back to our page. So make sure your sources are credible. So when possible, choose your own text. The reason I say choose your own text is because if you choose it, you're probably interested in it. You probably care about it. Um, so when that's not possible, research your topic. So let's say your teacher gives you information um, and you have to read about something like uh, making humans a multi-planetary species. So maybe you don't know what multi-planetary means. Um, what does that mean? It means humans living on planets other than Earth, something that humanity, as far as we know, has never done. Um, maybe you just need to know more about Elon Musk, so you research this person. Oh, he um, is the founder of a an electronic car company. Oh, he cares about the environment. He's this person that um, tries to uh, make money to change the world in a, in a productive way. Um, so we can research our topic. As we research and we relate it to familiar information, maybe you don't care about space exploration, but you really like fast cars. So you research and you find out that Elon Musk tried to make a really, really fast, um, efficient, clean electric car. And you're like, oh, okay, this is more interesting to me now. This is the same guy that did that? That's cool. Um, new information is often easier to digest, to understand, to process, when we can attach it to familiar information, particularly familiar information that we enjoy, that we like. We associate with something interesting to us, something positive. So when we relate something that we're learning to something we already know, we learn better. We learn better by connecting new knowledge to our existing knowledge, our previous knowledge. So uh, Fabio researches papers on, on Google Books um, and it's reliable, yeah. Uh, so you can search um, scholar.google.com and this is a good way to find credible sources also. We have a, a previous video on credible sources that you can go back and read, but um, it's 
uh, and I'll put that website right here. Um, I'll put my, I'll put all the websites I'm sharing um, in these class notes. Oops. There we go. So uh, Scholar, um, Google Scholar, and then my um, Facebook page as well. And then as we go to more sites, I'll just kind of keep copying and pasting. But um, so when you can connect it to information you're interested in, it makes it cooler. It makes it more interesting for you. Uh, so when you research your topic, you can become more interested. You can you can mix your media. What do I mean by mix your media? Um, a lot of students learn differently, and unless I would say more and more students don't read which in one way is kind of heartbreaking for a teacher because that's how I learned I grew up reading textbooks and getting my information from printed documents but in another way it's really exciting for a teacher because there are ways to transmit information more quickly um, you know presentations lessons like this um, videos on the internet uh, audiobooks you can do something else as you learn Sometimes, like like driving your car to work, you can listen to a book, um, and that in some ways can be more efficient. So mix your media. Uh, you can get bored easily reading. Uh, it happens, I think, to every reader. We all can get bored. Um, I'm reading a book right now that I love. It's so good, and so I spent yesterday sitting outside by the lake just reading like. 50 pages in a row not listening to anything else that was happening around me and it was awesome it was so good I was into it I was I was transported in this book I loved it I love books um, but it's not always common I get bored too when my teachers would give me a textbook and say read this um, I'd be like oh really that seems so boring and sometimes I would be so bored that I'd fall asleep on my book um, and teachers don't talk about that enough. Uh, they don't talk about the times that they were a student and they felt bored or they needed motivation to keep reading. Um, so you can mix it up a little bit. Read a little bit. bit. If your teacher gives you a book to read, you have to read it. Um, you should read it, I should say. Um, there's still that obligation. Um, but you can take little breaks and then watch related information to it. Um, you know, watch if there's information about the author uh, in the form of a video or something. Watch the video. Learn a little bit more about the author and then go back to the book. Um, if there's something artistic that's associated with it, if somebody painted a painting because of this text you had to read or about the subject that you're reading about, um, look into it. Find something that interests you related to the material and then uh, mix your media. Watch a video. Listen to some audio that's uh, contributing to it. So you can adapt to your learning style. Are you an audio learner? Are you a visual learner? A video might be better if you're a visual learner. Um, uh, music or, or something in audio form, even a book on tape or an audio book would be beneficial for you if you're a, an auditory learner. And if you're a kinesthetic learner and a tactile learner, you need to touch something, you need to move around, do that. Like, adapt to your learning style. Um, here is some software that you can use. This is called Natural Reader. There's a link here. Um, and I will include that link also in our notes. Uh, naturalreaders.com. And... Um, there's an online reader that you can copy text documents. So I'm just going to copy some text from this Owl Purdue site and paste it in here. Um, and I'm going to mute my mic and then play this for you. So that's a pretty natural voice. That's Gabriella from the US. Um, we can do a Spanish speaker here and see what that sounds like.
So that's with the accent of uh, a Spanish speaker. Um, let's see what their French speakers sound like. Okay, so that's one way that you can um, you can get pronunciation, you can get speech. Uh, I think the the U.S. English speakers are pretty good. All right, so the technology is. Uh, hopefully, you could hear that. Uh, the technology is not perfect, but it's okay. Um, okay, so a few of you didn't hear the sound. No one heard the voices, um, the speakers from the website. You can hear my speaking though, right? You can hear my microphone. No, no, yes, so one student heard them. Um, interesting. Okay. Well, this is just an example of, uh, this is an example of a website that can help you. So you could check it out. You can explore it on your own later. Um, okay. You guys can hear me. At least that's good, but check it out. This is one way that if you're an audio learner and you, you have difficulty reading, you can try listening to this and you might try to listen to this as you read. Um, so you can use this tool available online. The technology will get better and better and either this source of, of this tool will improve or a different source will come out that is better. Uh, but for now it's, it's one of the better ones that I've found um, so it's worth checking out. You might be able to also use dictation.io. This is where you can take speech and turn it into text. So natural reader was um, uh, text to speech. Dictation.io is uh, speech to text. So we can we can test it out a little bit. Uh, we can try to we can try to speak some words in English here and see how accurate it is. Even if I accelerate my rate of speech, it can pick up what I'm saying pretty easily and pretty accurately. I think this is a pretty good tool if you want to do speech to text. Not bad. Um, so you can see that, maybe I need to zoom in. You can see that this is dictating all of the words that I say. They're accurate and they're spelled correctly. Um, even the hyphenation or uh, contraction there <laughs> was changed to the correct they are. Um, so this is pretty good technology to take dictation from speech. Uh, you notice that it does not punctuate or capitalize. I think that there are commands here, much like speech to text on your cell phone, where you can say period, and it adds the period as you can see. Uh, it's not perfect, but it is a tool you can use. Okay, So this is another free online source that is helpful for you. Uh, another thing you can do to make your reading more interesting is share. Share it with someone else. Talk about what you're learning before and talk about it after. Make friends in college or use the friends that you already have to talk about your college experience or um, academic experience, whatever that is, training for work or technical college or university or master's or PhD program, whatever you're doing. Um, talk about it. So if you're reading about Elon Musk and SpaceX, do your research, look into it, find something interesting that you can sort of focus on, and then also talk to somebody about it. Talk to your family. Hey, guess what I learned today? Blah, 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 blah. By doing this, by talking about what you're learning before and after, um, say, oh, I'm really excited for class today. Today we're going to do a reading exercise about SpaceX um, and Elon Musk. By me saying that, by me priming someone else with that information, it does a couple things for me. One, it gets me thinking about it and it gets my brain in the groove of, oh yeah, I am doing this soon. I reminded myself. 
and then it also um, gives the potential for them to come back to me later and say, oh, how was that class? How was that class about uh, um, SpaceX and Elon Musk? What did you learn? And, you know, it's not a guarantee that someone's going to ask you about your, your studies, but it, it gives the opportunity for potential to, to have that happen. So, um, and Sura, the topic for today is reading strategies. How to make reading more enjoyable in academics. Like, how do I make assigned academic reading, you're welcome, to, uh, more interesting for me? How do I enjoy doing the work that my, my professors teach me or say that I have to do? Um, even if your subject seems boring, which that's going to happen, trust me, even if it seems boring and you can't utilize technology to make things easier, a simple conversation before you begin and after you end can help you find something enjoyable to attach to your academic information. Try questions like, what do you find interesting about this topic? Have you ever heard of SpaceX? What's, what do you think it's about? What, what can you tell me about it? How do you think this will directly affect our lives? So think about your own life. Do you want to travel to space? Would you never travel to space? Like, um, why? When you attach this information to personal narrative information, personal information about your own life, you remember it better. Your memory attaches better to things that are individual to you, specific to you. And then how does this relate to the work I love? So even if this is a topic that you hate, you don't enjoy it, you don't think it applies to you, how might it? How might this information apply to what you love, the work that you love? So if you want to be an electrical engineer, um, how does learning about um, biology of ocean creatures apply to your life? Um, it may seem like you cannot connect those two ideas, but I promise you, if you have a small conversation, a short conversation with uh, a friend for a while, you'll find a connection. You'll find a way to connect those two seemingly disparate ideas. Does, how does this relate to the work I love? Um, could, how could we do this better? So even if you don't enjoy the topic, you could say, well, let's critique it. Let's criticize this idea. How could we do this better? Um, I mean, I'm sure Elon Musk I don't want to speak for the guy, I've never met him, I'd love to, but um, I'm sure he would welcome someone to do what he's doing better. I bet Elon Musk would love if someone was doing what he's doing with SpaceX better. He wants to challenge people to be better, better than him even, um, because that's what he's doing. He's looking out around and saying, nobody's doing this. Why, why aren't people doing this? Uh, why aren't people making affordable, reusable uh, spacecraft? Why aren't people making affordable, um, uh, clean, fast, sexy cars that I can drive instead of a gasoline engine, combustion engine? Um, and so no one else was doing it. So he's like, well, I'll do it better. But I, that kind of work inspires other people to do better too. So I think that's the idea. The idea is how can we do this better? And then also the question, what's next? Okay, what haven't we even thought of yet? What could be done uh, that hasn't been done? Can we apply the same electrical um, energy that's used in Tesla to space travel? Can we, can we make the fuel more efficient? Um, or stop using fuel, rocket fuel altogether? Is there a different way to um, create enough thrust to, to launch out of, um, out of our atmosphere into orbit? Uh, let's see, you never know. So, Anwar, yes, you're a little bit late. That's okay though. Um, it's all right if you weren't able to listen to the audio. Um, you're welcome for sharing those those tools. Uh, solar tiles for the roof are interesting, yes. Um, <laughs> those with the most money will be able to live in space, will be left below in a colony on Earth. That's okay, I'll be here too. I doubt I'm leaving to go live in space anytime soon. Um, teleportation, 
might be possible. Leo's a big fan of particle physics, and technically it, it does seem possible. Uh, JB would rather, it says, space travel's a waste of money and energy. He'd rather end poverty and bring down dictatorships. A valid topic, a valid concern. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it'll be interesting to see the sunset revolving around Saturn, some of its rings. Okay, so we're kind of talking about different space topics and things in the chat. Um, let's take a look at the actual reading. Um, so here's an example of the exercise that I created for this reading. So we're going to preview this a little bit. Uh, for the reading, you'll be using metacognition skills. We've used this word before in class. Metacognition, broken down, is essentially means thinking about thinking. Um, thinking about the way you learn, the way that you think, and improving that ability. Um, so using metacognition skills, to, uh, thinking about thinking, to produce a critical analysis of the paper's findings. Before you begin, consider, here's Bloom's taxonomy. Um, this is a classification of learning objectives. Analyze, evaluate, create, apply, understand, and remember. Um, and then we have a link to Musk's paper. We have the Cornell Method note-taking system here, um, and then directions to uh, take notes on different sections. And then after those notes, um, the assignment is to create cri critical analysis questions for yourself, your partner, your group, to share this information, to talk about this information, and understand the subject better. So example question constructs. Uh, considering Bloom's revised taxonomy of learning objects, objectives are um, that knowledge exhibits previously learned material by recalling facts, terms, basic concepts, and answers. So what is blank? Uh, when did blank happen? How would you explain blank? Why did blank? How would? Uh, very simple question forms, right? There's comprehension, demonstrating understanding of facts and ideas by organizing, comparing, translating, interpreting, giving descriptions, and stating main ideas. How would you compare? How would you contrast? In your own words, what are facts or ideas? Um, there's application solving type problems uh, or questions. Um, Solving problems by applying acquired knowledge, facts, techniques. So what examples can you find to support blah, blah, blah? How would you show your understanding of what approach would you use to and what might happen if? There's analysis examining and breaking information into parts by identifying motives or causes. So what, what inference can you make? What understanding can you, um, can you give given this information? How would you categorize? Can you identify? Uh, you can evaluate and present and defend opinions um, by making judgments about that information. How would we compare this to? Um, which is better? Uh, is this contribution necessary? What is the importance of this? Um, and then creation and synthesis. So compiling information together in different ways by combining elements in a new pattern or proposing alternative solutions. What might have happened if we did this? If things had turned out differently, um, what could we do? Uh, okay. So we are talking about creating analysis questions, creating questions that help us understand the material um, and analyze the material after taking notes. So um, make summaries for each section. Here's the paper. This is the paper that we're looking at. We're not going to have time to read the whole thing. You notice like most academic papers though, um, uh, this is the title of the paper, this is the author um, and his title, his uh, credentials, and then this is the length of it. So you see charts, graphs, graphs, images, um, breakdowns, quantities. This is what academic reading looks like. Um, there is a lot of information here and it's a lot of esoteric information. It's information that um, that takes a lot of critical thinking, a lot of um, digesting to understand. But we're gonna look at the first part. The first part is more narrative. The first part is an introduction. 
Um, we, uh, I'll give those questions to everybody, Julian. I'll give those questions to everybody. So I'm just going to read a little bit here for you and I'm gonna highlight uh, and follow along. I'm gonna take the video off so that you can just see the screen here. And we're gonna read a little bit. So I'm gonna zoom in as much as I can. There we go. Uh, by talking about the SpaceX Mars architecture, I want to make Mars seem possible. Make it seem as though it is something that we can do in our lifetime. There really is a way that anyone could go if they wanted to. Why go anywhere? I think there are really two fundamental paths. History is going to bifurcate along two directions. One path is we stay on Earth forever, and then there will be some eventual extinct extinction event. I do not have an immediate doomsday prophecy, but eventually history suggests there will be some doomsday event. The alternative is to become a space-bearing civilization and a multi-planetary species, which I hope you would agree is the right way to go. So we know the author's standpoint, we know his stance, his beliefs, kind of right away. He's making strong points and giving you his position. So how do we figure out how to take you to Mars and create a self-sustaining city? A city that is not merely an outpost, but which can become a planet in its own right, allowing us to become a truly multi-planetary species. So why Mars? Sometimes people wonder, well, what about other places in the solar system? Why Mars? Our options for becoming a multi-planetary species within our solar system are limited. We have, in terms of nearby options, Venus, but Venus is a high pressure, super high pressure, hot acid bath. So that would be a tricky one. Venus is not at all like the goddess. So it would be really difficult to make things work on Venus. Then there is Mercury, but that is way too close to the sun. We could potentially go onto one of the moons of Jupiter or Saturn, but those are quite far out, much farther from, further from the sun, and much harder to get to. It really only leaves us with one option if we want to become a multi-planetary civilization, and that is Mars. We could conceivably go to our moon, and I actually have nothing... Uh, oops, it goes up to the next column on this page. Uh, I actually have nothing against going to the moon, but I think it is challenging to become multi-planetary on the moon because it is much smaller than a planet. It does not have any atmosphere. It is not as resource rich as Mars. It has got a 28 day. It has got a 28 day, whereas the Mars day is 24.5 hours. In general, Mars is far better suited ultimately to scale up to be a self-sustaining civilization. To give some comparison between the two planets, they are remarkably close in many ways. And he refers to Table One. In fact, we now believe that early Mars was a lot like Earth. In effect, if we could warm Mars up, we could once again have a thick atmosphere and liquid oceans. Mars is about half as far again from the sun as Earth is, so it still has decent sunlight. It is a little cold, but we can warm it up. It has a very helpful atmosphere, which, being primarily CO2 with some nitrogen and argon and a few other trace elements, means that we can grow plants on Mars just by compressing the atmosphere. It would be quite fun to be on Mars because you would have gravity that is about 37% that of Earth, so you would be able to lift heavy things and bound around. Furthermore, the day is remarkably close to that of Earth. We just need to change the populations because currently we have 7 billion people on Earth and none on Mars. So I'm going to, to stop there with the reading um, and you can continue to read this on your own. Um, I'm going to copy this link as well um, into our notes. I'm also going to um, copy the questions and the information in this document into our notes. Um, so you can kind of go through and follow along and complete those. Um, okay, so uh, I'm gonna make little notes here. Uh, my Facebook page, Google Scholar is finding credible academic sources. Uh, naturalreaders.com is text to speech. Dictation.io is speech to text. Um, this is Elon Musk's paper. And then these are the assignment questions. 
or activity. Okay. Uh, so I hope that um, this kind of gives you an idea of how you can make something more interesting if it's academic, if it's assigned to you, if it's forced on you to read. Um, I read this kind of stuff because I find it interesting and I like it. Um, but I hope you guys can find ways to, to find uh, academic reading more interesting. All right, uh, let's see. I'm just gonna go back through the, the questions here in the chat. Um, Kritaya uh, says, I do not get bored when I'm reading, but I fall asleep instead. That can happen. That, there's ways to prevent that too. You can try to read in a public place somewhere that, you know, go to a coffee shop or go to a park or go to, um, you know, make yourself just comfortable enough to not, to enjoy the experience, but not so comfortable that you are relaxed and can fall asleep. So sit in a chair that is, um, you know, not cozy, but just comfortable. Uh, that can help. And also avoiding reading while you're in bed. Like don't do your homework when you're in bed um, because you're likely to fall asleep or um, it just not be able to focus. Um, science is developing faster and faster and independently of our desires. Uh, it does kind of get away from us sometimes. Science moves fast. Uh, technology and development move fast. Okay. Um, uh, all right, so any questions about academic reading? Can you think of anything? Let's look at some uh, vocabulary from academic reading. Uh, let's see. Uh, here's something from, um, do I want this one or do I want, mm. let's see, here's a uh, reading on carbon uh, negative uh, being a carbon negative um, country. So this is about Bhutan. And um, Bhutan is uh, a kingdom which lies deep in the Himalayas. It's on the border between China and India. And it has pledged to remain carbon neutral for all time. So there's a talk, um, a TED talk, where Bhutan's prime minister, uh, Tsering uh, Tombe, Tomge, I, I cannot pronounce his name well. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm probably saying it wrong, but speaks about this idea, and he's very in, engaging speaker. He's funny. Um, he's kind. He's polite. He seems like a great, great individual. So I encourage you to check it out. But let's look at some of the academic words that are used here, and this is something that's specific to environmental science and um, uh, so and related things like meteorology, biology. Etc. Etc. Um, so, let's look at some of this vocabulary and uh, and ask me if you have questions about any of this vocabulary. Um, do we know what maintaining means? What does it mean to maintain something? What does it mean to maintain? Um, what does it mean to exacerbate? something to exacerbate. Uh, what do you think? And yes, I will put class notes here. Let me share this and I'll say anyone with the link can view it. And I will just copy the link into the chat and we'll see a bunch of people pop up here, I'm sure, in just a second. Um, so yes, there are there is the the class notes. So maintaining is lasting. Yes, exacerbates. Uh, maintaining is to have control of something. Yes, to maintain something for something to continue. What about exacerbate? What does that mean? And then we'll look at one more. 
Um, how about the word sanctuary? We talk about wildlife sanctuary. What is a wildlife sanctuary? Uh, what's that mean? Worsen, yes. Sanctuaries or wildlife sanctuary. What do those mean? Um, French Leo says, am I going to make a YouTube channel? Maybe. I might miss doing these classes. If I do make a YouTube channel, um, and if I do continue these classes on my own just for fun, uh, I will post it on my Facebook. So check my Facebook. Um, I think we're all friends on Facebook. But check that over the next few weeks. I'm going to be gone for two weeks. I'm traveling a little bit. Um, but uh, I will um, I will announce it on there when I if I do something like that. Okay. Um, got some requests here. There we go. Yeah, if we're not friends, add me on Facebook, and I'll announce if I do any classes like this. Maybe I will. Um, we'll see. I, I like these, and I'll probably miss it. So I may decide to to do this just to connect with you guys again and and hang out. Um, okay. So not allowing to harm or kill the animals. Yeah, a sanctuary. A sanctuary is um, a place that is safe. Sanctuary just means safe place um, at its most basic meaning. And a wildlife sanctuary is a safe place for animals. Um, just like if you put the word human before that, a human sanctuary is a safe place for humans. A wildlife sanctuary is a safe place for wildlife. Um, so that is the meaning of that word. So these words, sanctuary, and maintaining and exacerbating, these can be used in basically any academic uh, paper. You could be writing about economy, you could be writing about statistics, you could be writing about biology, chemistry, physics, um, politics, you could be writing about anything, really. Um, any STEM field, any science field, any academic paper, you could use words like this. Um, so keep that in mind. Build your academic vocabulary find something about reading that interests you and go with it continue with it uh we are nearing the end of our last class here um we've talked about uh we've taught the very first time this is the only time that this lesson has ever been taught um from smart english uh for stem uh stem english something that i've created and nicole created with me uh, so that was cool. Thank you for being the first class to ever study this document, this page, um, this material that we made. And um, we talked about how to find credible sources, uh, what that means. We talked about academic vocabulary, um, which can be used in lots of different fields of academics, um, lots of different papers. We talked about uh, resources that are available online, such as Google Scholar and um, Natural Readers and Dictation and um, we looked at a paper written by a billionaire um, environmentalist Elon Musk. So there's a lot of lot of things that we covered not just in this class but in all the previous classes and um, I just want to thank you guys for uh, for being here with me and for um, you know studying with me and I hope that all of you um, feel that your English is better for for being in this class and for um, uh, for learning with me I mean I think good teachers understand that they learn with their students and they don't it's not a one-way process we don't just give you information and then you prove that you got that information that's like me tossing you a cell phone and you saying yep got it okay a teacher is more like a conversation it's more like both of us being on the phone talking to one another um, interacting and learning together 
Uh, believe it or not, your teachers don't know everything. <laughs> Any teacher that tells you that they know everything, in my opinion, is a bad teacher. <laughs> Because we don't. We're still learning with you. Um, your teachers know a lot, but they know a lot about the subject that they know. They don't know about a lot of other things. And they can always continue to learn also. Hmm. So, yes, Ensura, uh, or Ezranur, Ezranur, this is the last class for me with Smart English. Um, the Canadian uh, studio has made a decision to, you know, scale it down, uh, to focus in on uh, two phenomenal educators, Sean and Karim. Uh, they're up at the Vancouver studio, and that will still keep happening. They're still going to have these classes uh, every week, as far as I'm told. And they're just scaling it back a little bit for now. So who knows what the future will hold? Um, maybe someday I'll be back. Uh, and if I, you know, if enough time goes by and I, I miss doing this and I miss interacting with you guys, maybe I'll announce, I'll, I'll do, uh, you know, just my own YouTube channel of, of lessons for you guys so we can tune in and, um, and study together again. So watch out for that on my Facebook. If I, if I decide to do it, I don't know. Um, it's not something I've really thought of, but, um, maybe, you know, I, I won't say no. Um then I, I'll announce it on there, I'm sure. So check out my Facebook, say hi. I'm not dying, I'm not going anywhere. I'm still gonna be uh, living here in Spokane, Washington, USA. Um, I'm still you know, an English teacher and uh, uh, I work in, with different, lots of different organizations and groups um, and I, I'm sort of a leader in education in this part of the, the world. So I'm gonna keep doing that, keep building classes, keep, um, creating material and trying to make learning better. I'm gonna to try to make education better, that's my goal. So, uh, thank you guys so much, you're wonderful. Uh, Julian, I will check out your videos. Um, and yeah, so my, my email I may not use anymore, the one that I used attached to Smart English. So if you've been using my Smart English email, uh, it's not gonna work anymore. Uh, so you, you should probably just, um, you know, reach out to me on Facebook, uh, you know, or I, you can find me. I'm still, my profile's public, you can find me and, and say hi. Um, you guys are wonderful, so great, I really appreciate it. Hopefully this is not goodbye, this is just, I'll see you later. Um, and, because I, I, I'd like to continue this, I mean, you guys are great. It's been a lot of fun. Please remember, um, you guys are all very, very smart, very intelligent students, and uh, you make me laugh, you make me smile, you make me proud when you, you share your amazing work with me, and I get a chance to see um, what you guys have created, what you've built, what you've made. Um, so go on and do good things. Be good to each other. Uh, be good to our planet. Be good to... Um, everybody you interact with. Be good to your friends, be good to people who say they aren't your friends, um, be good to everybody that you interact with, uh, and we can all kind of together make this world a better place. I will try to help as much as I can with uh, English to make that happen. So thank you guys, you're wonderful. Uh, I don't really know what else to say. I mean, you guys are awesome. I've had so much fun here. Um, Come over to Central Oregon anytime. Uh, Juan, thank you. I appreciate it. Central Oregon is close to here, so you never know. I might wind up there. Uh, please, please, check my Facebook like once a week and just see what's going on. Say hi. Um, and if I have any updates for you, I'll put them on there. Uh, so make sure you stay in touch. You guys have my contact information. And have an amazing day. Have an amazing rest of your day, uh, rest of your weekend, rest of your week. Um, and yeah, be good to each other. Thanks so much, everybody. It's been a blast. And I will see you when I see you. Okay? All right. Bye-bye.